The NIR has been going for over just over two years, and today is our 26th monthly meeting. I recently underwent a number of changes in my personal life, which include relocating to an area outside the Helderberg. It also became a bigger challenge to find new presenters for our meetings every month. And now that the pandemic is part of normal life, more and more apologies were received for each meeting. In short, I've decided to put the NIR on ice for a while, and today will be our uh, last meeting. Okay, so today's meeting is about a potentially scary subject, the dark web. Every now and again there are media reports that the, about the bad things that happen in this new type of underworld. The more we know about the dark side of the cyber world, the better and safer we can deal with it. So I ask Professor Martin Butler to close the NIR with a discussion about the dark web. He was a presenter at three previous occasions with us, first, namely the first two meetings that we had in 2020, as well as the September meeting last year, so exactly a year ago. Now, for the sake of all the new members who did not meet Professor Butler last year, allow me a brief introduction. Martin is the head teaching and learning at the University of Stellenbosch Business School, an associate professor, professor for digital enterprise management. He has several academic qualifications, including an MBA and PhD from the University of Stellenbosch. Before joining the academic world, Martin had extensive experience in the commercial IT world from software developer to consulting. Martin has an active interest in the related fields of digital transformation, technology futures, project management and innovation management, and lectures in these disciplines at the University of Stellenbosch and in Asia, Europe and the USA. He frequently appears in the local media on matters technology related and has presented papers in these areas of interest at conferences locally and abroad. Martin revealed to me when we had a test run last week that he accepted a new position in Belgium. So he and his wife will move to Belgium in January 2023, where he will be lecturing at a university. That is a bold move, but sounds very exciting to me. His two children are both independent adults now, so it is only Martin and his wife who undertakes the move. Welcome again, Martin. Uh, we look forward to learn about the dark web, and over to you. Thank you, Johan. I uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, I, I had to smile at the independent adult children. So uh, off we go. And um, what I'd like to do today is uh, to share a little bit with you around the dark web. Johan, if you can just give me a thumbs up, confirm that you can just see my screen and not the design of my slides, but you see the full slide. Yes, I can see the spider web and the dark web as well. Fantastic. I hope there's not too many people with arachnophobia today in the meeting because, Anne, thank you for that thumbs up. If you have an uh, arachnophobia, it may be a, a challenging one for you because I've decided to make it sp spider themed for today. Um, I, I did not prepare a vast amount of slides and I tried to keep it very non-technical. Um, I would really love for you to ask me questions because the topic is very broad and I'm going to try to simplify um, and then also conclude this, what, what does it actually mean for, for us. So um, in the bigger scheme of things, what I would like to do today is, is to start off um, by explaining uh, the dark web. What, what is the dark web? How do we think about the dark web and what is the dark web? Uh, the history of the dark web, um, how do we access it? If there's any anybody keen 
to access the dark web, how do you do that? Um, then I'd just like to compare three different sections of the internet, if you like, the dark, the deep, um, and the surface web. Um, I want to talk about what we can find on the dark web. So that is alluding to what Johan has explained, uh, some, some rather disturbing things happening there. Um, I'll deal with the most common question whenever I speak about the dark web. The first question is always, why don't they just shut it down? Um, if, if, if it's so problematic, why don't we just shut it down? And, and then I'm literally just going to conclude with what does it mean for me and for you? What, what does it mean? Um, what do we need to be cognizant of um, in the world of the dark web um, that is important and that we should, should consider? Okay, so that's the, the, the plan for the day. Um, I, I, I enjoy interaction. So um, I have my chat open and I also have um, the function open when I can see uh, who is speaking to me. So you are more than welcome uh, to have a chat, uh, to speak to me um and ra raise raise your hands uh sherry thank you thank you for um wishing me congrats with the new appointment um it's uh, a lovely opportunity um but the intent is to return to south africa i i love the country and the continent very deeply and dearly but i'm looking forward to concluding the last 11 years of my of my career in europe now um to understand what the dark web is, um, I'm going to look at the layers of the internet. So I just would like to explain um, the three different sections in which we would normally uh, divide the internet. Now, the internet in principle is just a collection of computers, literally thousands and millions and millions of computers globally connected that exchanges information, as you well know. Um, and in this collection, about 4% of that um, is what we would call internet content of the World Wide Web. So whether you type in www, you go to Google, you search for something, whether you go directly to News24 or Daily Maverick, or you go to Take A Lot or to Amazon to buy something, um, you're accessing the World Wide Web. Um, and that uh, www that we put in our browsers is to access then what we would call the surface web or the World Wide Web. In layman's terms, that's mostly what people refer to when they talk about the internet. When somebody says the internet, um, we're actually talking about this roughly 4% of the internet that is really the, the visible part of the internet and that we can all access with our normal browsers. The vast majority of the internet is what we call the deep web. Um, and the deep web is information that could just be off behind some level of authentication. So, for example, in Stellenbosch University, anybody on this call could browse to the Stellenbosch University website and you can see everything on our website and that sits on the World Wide Web. However, students and faculty can log in, we can provide our credentials, and then we get to a lot of policy documents and many, many other things. Um, and all the services that is rendered to us online. So that is the learning management system that the students are using, our online assessments, um, our, all of the information that is not within the public domain, um, but there is some form of credentialing that we need to supply. And that would form a small part of then the deep web. This includes um, medical information from the Medical Research Council, government information, lots and lots of information that is placed on servers that are accessible but not publicly accessible without providing your credentials and um, also included in here are things like email our email uses the internet but it's a protocol and there's our authentication every time we open our email app um, our laptop computer or, or ipad supplies credentials this is my username and password and those credentials then gives us access to our email account and only for those with, with the credentials. Now, the, the, by a distance, most of the internet traffic is in the deep web, and we don't necessarily need special tools to access the deep web. So um, whether you use your standard browser that came with your laptop or reinstalled Chrome um, or Firefox, um, those browsers um, provide access for us to the deep web. Um, there are specific services. If you've ever used a service like WeTransfer, I think at some stage um, you'd had, uh, you, it was one of the tips that Johan may have shared with you as well. 
If we use retransfer, you want to have a very big file, send it somewhere, um, you would use your browser, you would upload the file, and then beneath the service, surface of the internet, there are certain servers that's communicating with each other, and they would exchange the file and they would tell a person that you're able to download the file. So that, that particular file or large set of data would move from the surface part, the visible part, into the deep web. It would transfer on FTP servers from the deep web and it would emerge on the other side again. Nothing devious, it's just not the normal visual information that's happening. Sometimes I explain this to people, it's like walking through Somerset Mall. If you walk through Somerset Mall, the World Wide Web is the visible. You're walking in the passages, you see the storefront, and you see everything neatly packaged uh, on the shelves. But the deep web um, is in the background of all of these stores. There are um, warehouses, there's distributions, um, there's shutter doors that open and close, there are fridges. And, and every now and again, somebody would disappear into the back end of the store uh, to replenish the stock on the shelf or to do a goods receive or to ship something out. Um, or if the store has an online, they would do that. So the deep web um, is complementary to the World Wide Web. Um, and it's the, shall we say, the less appealing part. Um, Woolies does not want us to walk through their warehouse, but their warehouse is critical for them to do their merchandising and for us to, to go and buy all of that. So that would be normal of all of this. The dark web um, is where things get interesting. It's estimated to be about 6% of the internet. And the dark web by design is encrypted. So by design, um, it does something fundamentally different. Um, and that fundamentally different is what I would like to share, share with you today. Now, um, just a quick recap on encryption. I know there was a previous session on that. What, what do we mean by encryption? Um, the easiest way for me always to explain encryption is if you remember in primary school, you fell in love with that little boy and girl on the other side of the class. You wanted to send them a love letter, but you didn't want everybody to know what is in the love letter. And you agreed a secret code with each other. A is seven and B is nine and C is three and D is whatever. And then you would send the love letter across the classroom and it would just say 3795793. Um, and the person on the other side would then have the decryption key. They would take your love letter um, and they would transcribe the numbers back into something that makes sense. Maybe saying, um, I like you a lot. Would you mind buying me a tiger toffee um, from the tuck shop at short, short break? Um, and that's the encryption. Now, the dark web um, was devised to encrypt data from the word go. Um, it was never intended to be visual, um, and it was never intended to support the World Wide Web like the symbiotic relationship we have between um, the surface and, and, and the deep web. And you need specialized software to access that. Now, I'll explain that shortly um, because I think it's important for us to understand the specialized software and, and the role of the software. But more interesting for me is a quick history. So, so how did the dark web start? How, how did we start with this thing? Um, and like so many other things, um, it, it started for not necessarily the best of purposes, but not necessarily for illegal um, activities. It was not developed by cyber criminals or cyber bullies or cyber crackers, as we call them in Afrikaans. It was the US government. So the US government um, created, um, amongst many of the things that they created globally, um, they created the dark web. And the creation of the dark web was really about good old spying. So when spying became digital, if we watch old movies or James Bond movies, or spying movies, there's always a cellar into which the spy would descend. Um, they would open these old antiquated computers with lots of dials and they would dial in or establish radio communications with their handlers wherever they may be in the world. Um, and where spying and the transferring of information globally became digitized, it was necessary to create a specific mechanism to do this. So you can think of it back as that example of the kids sitting in the classroom. And then in the classroom, um, there was an agreement on how I will communicate through the entire playground and sending this information about. Um, and they developed then um, what we call the onion router. And the onion router 
was a specific mechanism to encrypt traffic. And I'll explain a little bit now of how that has worked. So around the 1990s, about 30, 32 years ago, um, the US government, um, it was, I think, in the naval laboratories that they developed the technology that is fundamental um, to the dark web today. Now, I hope some of you may have heard from DARPA. So DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Um, and many of the, the most, can I call it boundary pushing technologies, many of the technologies that would make our jaws drop um, was developed by DARPA um, over a broad range of technologies. Um, so they were some of, the, some of the first laboratories to work on artificial intelligence and many, many technologies with potential military applications. Um, in the early days of the internet, um, of computers, um, a lot of that development work was done by DARPA. And this uh, technology, this anonymous technology was then handed over to, to DARPA. Um, and interestingly enough, they then handed it over to civil rights groups. So the technology that was developed for spying, for spies to communicate with each other, um, was handed over to several civil rights groups. So it became in the public domain, um, civil rights groups with a particular uh, technological slant uh, would then have access to this particular. And the, and the interesting question is, is why would they hand it over? Um, why is it that you develop something that you keep anonymous? I've developed this little code between two people in the classroom that we can send messages to each other. Why would I then put that in the public domain? What is the value? Now, there's, there, there's two theories, and I want to emphasize that they are theories. Um, I think they both hold water. Um, the one is purely to support their own activities. So if, if this is not um, pushed into the public domain, um, agents that are not necessarily one level away, but two, three, four levels away, um, would struggle to partake within this. So if somebody would like to send me an anonymous message from some corner on the school ground, um, and this encryption and decryption is not widely accessible, um, they would not be able to send me this information. So it was purely to support their own spying activities. And then the stronger theory is that um, if the US government kept um, this particular technology only to themselves, if at any stage you would find this information, you would know that it's associated with the US government. So I could immediately smell a rat because I know that this is only used by the US government. It's a little bit like using a blue ink fountain pen to write all your messages. And if you then send a very angry letter to your enemy in blue fountain pen, um, anybody that analyzes that says, well, that message must come from Ann Wilson. Um, and Ann Wilson sent it um, because she's the only person that writes with a blue fountain pen. Um, and the US government, to an extent, um, realized that um, this is widely used. They use it extensively for their spying activities. And it would be better if it is used at a global level so that you could not trace the letter that Anne wrote back to Anne based on the blue ink, but everybody now has blue fountain pens. Um, so you could, they could continue using it, um, but you could not necessarily point it um, to, to the US government. The challenge is that um, the network then became vulnerable to infiltration. And I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that in 1997, um, they foresaw what is happening on the dark web today and where people actually infiltrated it and it's used for many, many other things as well. I, I often, and I think I may have actually used this example previously, technology for me is like a knife. Um, we, we can always say, but why do we have knives? We have knives for cooking. Uh, the fact that we can cut our meat and we can do a lovely uh, whatever we would like to do when we make a meal and we can eat. However, um, we also use, people also use knives for purposes that are not necessarily that noble. And the fact that knives and guns are used in robberies does not necessarily mean that the initial intent was not a good intent. It, it is the lack of ability to control the application thereof that is leading to gun violence and knife crime. And in this instance, leading to, to the emergence of, of the dark web as an entity. And it's only when it became infiltrated that it became known as, as the dark web. Now, 
Um, how do you access it and, and, and what is then fundamentally the difference between all of these webs? So to access the dark web, please don't, <laughs> you need two things. Uh, the first thing that you need is, is a virtual private network um, that I know that you have dealt with in a previous session. And, and a, vir a virtual private network is purely a digital way to encrypt that message that you are sending. And the virtual private network just makes it rather difficult to find the source of the information. It's literally like walking through Somerset Mall with a mask. If you walk through Somerset Mall with a mask, um, you can still walk around, you can do your business, um, but the cameras won't know that you are there and people won't recognize you. So a virtual private network just means that your location from which you browse, that unique IP number associated with your mobile phone or your tablet or your laptop computer um, is masked from the end user. So the person does not necessarily know where their traffic originates from. And if I don't know where the traffic originates from, it means that um, I, I remain anonymous to, to an extent. And then the second part, um, people talk about, sometimes they will talk about the Onion browser or the Tor browser. Um, now Tor is, as IT people like to do, just a simple acronym for the Onion router. And the onion router just means that the traffic are routed through multiple nodes. So if, for example, you are now sitting in the Helderberg area, I'm sitting in Stellenbosch, and we are using Zoom to communicate to each other, it means that your traffic um, goes from your home to your internet service provider to a Zoom server that you can actually see by clicking on Zoom, and it will tell you where that Zoom server is and it will then travel back to me in my home. And it means that there is literally about five nodes, my laptop, my internet service provider, the Zoom server, your internet service provider, and your laptop. And those are the nodes through which this information is, is passing at the moment. Now, the way the Onion router is working is to create multiple nodes for you to access on the dark web a particular um, site or a particular file. And in this simplified version, um, there's just one relay node in the middle. Basically says there's a guard node. So if you use the Thor browser, if you would browse to the dark web, um, you would enter the internet at your internet service provider. But then that information would go through a guard node and it will go through relay nodes and it will literally hop across the world until it gets the access node until you get where you need to be. And if we think in real terms, if I want to pay money for devious purposes for Johan, I have asked Johan to do something for me that he shouldn't have done. And I promise him 10,000 Rand. If I go to my bank or to my internet banking and I pay 10,000 Rand to Johan, it's not that difficult for the authorities to trace um, the payment. And we quite often see that in our, in our television stories or in the movies that they trace the money. And when you trace the money, you say, but hang on a minute, there's a, a, a relationship between Johan and Martin because Martin paid Johan and now we start smelling a rat. But if I pay that into account in Zimbabwe, that goes to an account in Kenya, that goes to an account in Singapore, that goes to an untraceable account in Switzerland, that goes to Russia, then it goes to Japan and then back to Botswana and then to Johan, it's not that easy um, for the law detecting agencies to then figure out um, how this money, all they know is that John got money at some stage and Martin had some money that he paid, um, but they cannot necessarily make the causal link. And that then makes it very difficult to, to, to determine that. Um, and that's the essence of the, of the Onion router or the Thor browser. Um, and that is as simple as that. If you would like to access the dark web, please don't. Um, you would have to install a VPN. There are free VPNs. I wouldn't be surprised if some people on this call already use VPNs. Um, and the Thor browser is free. You can download it, you can install it. It looks and functions a little bit like Chrome or Firefox or Edge or Internet Explorer or Safari. It's not that difficult, um, but the inner workings is fundamentally different. Um, and it then opens that layer for you. It lifts the layer into um, the dark web. And there are specific search engines that you can then access. If you use Google, you kind of access the, the, the dark web, um, but there are search engines that is, that is enabled. And if you would like to buy, for example, um, Dennis's credit card number, and I'm saying I'm going to the dark web, I know Dennis Bach, I see that he is driving an Aston Martin. He must be a man of good means. So I would go to the dark web and I would 
target Dennis box, um, credit card details, and then see if anybody has compromised it and if it is available um, on, on the dark web. I can see Bernard making notes there. That's his plan. He says, I didn't know it was so easy to get a hold of, of Dennis's credit, credit card details. Now, if we compare um, the, this with each other quickly, I hope it makes sense to you. Um, it's kind of a summary of what I've said up to now. Um, if we look at the surface web, it's freely accessible. It can be visited using any browser. Um, we can go to Google and Bing, and we can use Facebook and Amazon and take a lot and use 24 and whatever we'd like to do. Then there's a deep web. It requires our login credentials. Um, you can also visit by any browser. It's not usually found by search engines, so it wouldn't be indexed. So when you search for some particular policy or document, you won't find it. But if I authenticate myself, I will find that. And that could be confidential databases of governments, universities, and multiple kinds of organization. And then we have the dark web. This requires a special browser. Um, so you can only do it with a Thor browser. Um, and the search engines on the dark web is very rudimentary. Uh, you would mostly find that you know exactly what um, the URL is, the web addresses, and it's normally a very long, complex string. Um, and you would normally go there directly. Um, and you won't find it on our normal search engines at all. Uh, Google will never. So if you go into your normal search engine, it will never ever direct you to the dark web because it's physically impossible for it to direct to the dark web. So you do not have to live in fear that I can click on the wrong link um, and land up in the dark web. It's physically not, not possible for, for that to happen. Um, and I'll explain to you now a little bit of kind of the services. What, what are the things? Um, what, what are the things that's that's happening um, on, on the dark web? Um, I hope the distinction is clear. Um, understanding the different the different layers of, of the internet. Um, nothing? Okay. Good stuff. Let's let's continue. So, uh, what, what can we find on the on the dark web? Um, why does it exist? We now know that the Americans created, it like so many other things in life, that turned out different from what they anticipated. Um, and what do we find today on the dark web? What 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 is it that um, people keep themselves busy with, and why people would go to the dark web? Um, uh, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Apologies for that sneeze. Bless you. Um, firstly, um, black markets. So, so uh, the biggest use of the dark web is for black markets. Um, in these black marketplaces, you'll find all sorts of goods can be bought and sold. Um, if you want to buy a Netflix account or DSTV logins or uh, whatever you would like to find, um, credit card numbers, weapons, drugs, uh, you will find that. So the black market is rife on uh, the dark web. Um, and whatever you can think about buying um, illegally in the physical world, um, you can buy that um, on the dark web as well. It is basically a digitization of the black market of people have been selling, selling organs and guns and drugs um, and all of these things for, for um, as long as humankind has existed. And the dark web created the perfect place for all of these black markets. Now, these are fairly simple, illegal. Um, it, it, it is illegal. And they are being shut down every now and again. So uh, a particular black market site, uh, if it is uh, compromised, um, the, the FBI um, is, is by distance the most active law enforcement agency on the dark web. And if they would find a black market site um, that is selling, for example, materials to manufacture bombs or even complete bombs, um, they will shut these sites down. It's not the most difficult to target a particular black market site um, because once you've cracked the anonymity and you have reached that, there are means and mechanisms that if you're really technically proficient that you could potentially do that. Second thing that we find on the black market is, is email services and anonymous email services. So you want to send an email um, we've seen the horrific examples in South Africa where whistleblowers um, are then compromised and the lives of whistleblowers are, are taken. Um, and that would typically happen if you use your email account and you dish the dirt on some dirty politician or business person, um, and they would trace that back to the person. So although um, we tend to say that it is anonymous to provide that information, 
Um, the truth is, if you send an email somewhere, even if it's an anonymous account run by Deloitte or EY or K KPMG, um, the, the chances of um, tracing that back to you is just 100%. And if you go to some of the email services, um, you'll find that um, you can be completely anonymous and it is very difficult for people to trace that, if not impossible. Now, this is legal, so you can't shut it down. But obviously, you can use the email to communicate illegal things. You can communicate um, and recruit people for ISIS or for terrorists um, or for whatever the case may be. So just like we can use normal email for illegal purposes, um, you could also do that with email. But we can't shut it down because there is value in these email services. Secure file uploads and transfers. Um, I saw, I think it was yesterday or the day before, um, that uh, Vladimir Putin has granted Russian citizenship to Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden that famously dished the dirt on um, the massive global spying activities of the Russian government, of the American government. Um, and he used a secure file upload and transfer protocol um, on the dark web. So um, if you would like to anonymously move things around, you can do it using the dark web as well. Then message boards and chat rooms, um, also legal because it's not illegal to have a message board and a chat room. Um, but most of these then are dedicated to things that um, are dangerous or illegal or unethical um, activities. So you would typically find that uh, terrorist groups or groups that have some not totally legal or ethical um, theme or discussion topic um, they would turn to the dark web and they would frequent these message boards and they would communicate with each other. If we have a shared passion for toy pomps or pomeraniums or border collies, we will use a message board on the internet because there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if we have a shared passion to overthrow the government and we would like to mobilize ourselves and to overthrow the government and to do things to government officials, um, then we will actually turn to these message boards um, and we can communicate and collaborate um, anonymously on, on, on these message boards. And then um, the one that's actually a very good reason for the existence of uh, the dark web is, is whistleblowing activities. So some of the more technically inclined companies um, have realized that if you create your whistleblowing site on the dark web and you provide very clear instructions, um, you actually entice people that are more technologically inclined to blow the whistle um, and do that um, on the dark web because they know that their identity is then not, not compromised. And that's an, a, a legal activity that happens. There, there is a part of the dark web um, that I don't even want to talk about and I don't even want to create pictures around. Um, it is really the underbelly of humanity at its worst. Um, if you're talking about um, child pornography, um, uh, snuff where, where a person would be killed and they would make a video clip of a person being killed. Um, they would do, terrorist group would do beheadings of humans. Um, so, so literally some of the most horrific things that we can, can think about. And if people want a mechanism to distribute that information, um, then you will find that that, that is on, on, on the dark web as well. Um, you cannot land in trouble for Googling on, on the surface web, um, but if you're intrigued by this, um, you can Google that and you can read it, but you need a strong stomach. It's like reading the Sunday newspaper. You need a strong stomach. Um, there's some activities in there, which, which is not uh, by a distance the biggest part of the dark web. It's really the, the, the tip of the tip. Um, but if you have uh, the most horrific content to share, um, then the, and you will need to be completely anonymous. Um, then that would happen on 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 the dark web as well, or in the in the darkest part of the of the dark web um, at at least. Now the interesting thing is then why don't we shut this down? Why 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 don't we shut this down? Why why is it that we that we tolerate um, the dark web if we find that there's illegal markets, if um, our our identities identities have been compromised? and people are selling our identity, I, I would be surprised if every single person on this call is not identity, not necessarily your credit card numbers and your bank account numbers. Um, but if you brought a, bought a property in South Africa between 1970 and 2017, 
So in the 47 years, if you had any property that you bought or sold between 1970 and 2017, then your information is for sale on the dark web as well, because that database of deeds registration in South Africa, where transfers of properties were registered, was leaked onto the internet and it went up for sale on the dark web. Now, if they know your ID number and your address at that point in time and your full names and spouse and whatever you divorced in terms of this property transfer, that's not necessarily that valuable. People might pay a rand or two for that. The moment that they've compromised credit card details, bank account details, um, credentials like usernames and passwords, then they start asking dollars, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty dollars for that, um, because that is then how they add value to your to your identity by saying not only do we have the identity of this individual, the passport number, an IT number, but we also have a current active credit card or an old credit card or a mobile number, whatever that people could potentially use. Um, to further compromise your, your assets and, and, and get their hands on it. Now, there's really three main reasons. Um, the first one, it's, it's decentralized. It, there's not a single thing to shut down. We can't walk up to a computer and shut it down. It's like thinking we're stopping people from Cape Town to get to Johannesburg by putting up blocking the N1 at Paul. And we say, okay, we're not going to get people from Cape Town to Joburg because we block the N1 at Paul. Um, there are just 50,000 different routes to get there. I can take the N2 or I can get off the N1 and I can get back on it. I can go via Uppington and actual fact, I can go via Cairo if I want, or I can fly from Cape Town to um, Washington and from Washington to Tokyo and from Tokyo to Sydney and from Sydney to Johannesburg. So you, you cannot um, block the dark web because it's completely decentralized from 1997. Um, when the technology was really opened um, and many people bought onto that. Second one is that um, it is legal mixed with illegal. Um, we all know that um, if you go into many flea markets in many places, um, if you walk up to a person selling cheap watches and you ask him you would like to have some drugs, they just lift the deck with the cheap watches and below that you can buy some marijuana and sometimes uh, stronger drugs. Um, but you can't shut down all flea markets because there's one or two individuals that use flea markets all across South Africa um, to push the goods that they shouldn't be pushing. And that's part of it. There is a legal part of the dark web. So there are things that people are doing. And if not legal, let's say at least not illegal. Um, and it means that you take um, guns and knives away from everybody because we have knife crown and gun crown and it simply doesn't make any sense. And then um, lastly, and, and probably the single biggest reason why there's no willpower to do this is that it's still extensively used by governments all across the world. Um, so as much as what the governments would um, bemoan the state of the dark web, invest resources into crime intelligence agencies to protect us from the dark web, um, they are also the exploiters of that. It would be the way in which James Bond, if Daniel Craig, sadly, is not going to make another James Bond movie, but if he wants to contact Q and M and exchange information anonymously, um, he would turn to the dark web, and that would mean that the information cannot be intercepted, and it could also um, not be traced back to the recipient um, and the sender of, of that information. So there's no it's not technically possible and neither is there really any willpower or do we have a legal standing to, to shut down the dark web and any of these three um, would be um, sufficient not to shut it down but all three in combination just means that it's never ever going to shut down so bernard um, in the regulation of, of the internet um, it is decentralized so um, there's a technical regulation in terms of the protocols how does it physically work um, and the Internet Society and a couple of technical custodians are determining what is an IP number and how does it work and what are the technological layers. Um, and then can we say that the addressing scheme, so just like I have an address in Stellenbosch, 1 Dorp Street, Stellenbosch, South Africa, which means that anybody anywhere in the world, if they write 1 Dorp Street, Stellenbosch, South Africa, um, it would reach me. That's the point that I physically reach. And that's our domains. So the domain zoom.us, the domain Stellenbosch, whatever the case may be, um, those are decentralized at national level. So within every country, um, there is a regulating body 
um, that is determining how um, these domains are distributed and, and how they become available. And in South Africa, actually, there's a lot of um, rumbling at the moment in terms of monetizing that as our, as our government is getting increasingly desperate to, to tap the last cent out of those few people that has money left in the country. Um, they, are, they are aiming for these things and um, the regulating authority in South Africa that does domain name regulations are, are trying to do that. But the very short version to your question, Bernard, is actually nobody because we can, we can govern the, uh, we can regulate how domain names are being issued and we can regulate the underlying technology. Um, but there's a lot of wiggle room and maneuverability and flexibility between those things. And it's not necessarily that people can necessarily relate that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm concluding. Um, what does it mean for you and me? What, what, what does it mean for us? Why, why did I torture you in understanding what is the dark web? Should we be concerned? Should we not necessarily be concerned? Is it something that is bound to cross our paths that we should know about? And what should we do about that? Um, I thought it's probably after such a somber theme time to do something of a lighter note. I, I, I really, really love this comic where the wife is turning to the husband and said, what are you doing on the dark web? And he says, I forgot my password, so I'm looking it up. So obviously we can do a password reset, but you could probably go to the dark web and find some compromised um, credentials there as well, be it that you would potentially have to pay to get your own password back. It's like somebody coming to your car, park outside your home, they steal your tires, and then they set up a little shop at the bottom of the street, and you can go back and you can buy back your own car's tires because somebody has uh, appropriated, they have decided that they are now the owners of that. And that's essentially what is happening on the dark web information that is ours, um, is being stolen and being, being made available to people. And, and I, I'd like to conclude by saying, should we fear the dark web? Should we, should we be afraid of the dark web? Is it necessarily that we need to be afraid of? And the answer is no, because um, you, you cannot, if you, if you don't go there, it cannot directly hurt you. It is physically impossible for you to land on the dark web using your normal computer and browser, unless you purposefully install a VPN, unless you purposefully install the Tor browser, and unless you know the website that you need to go to, you cannot by accident land on the dark web. Neither is it coming to get you. The dark web is not like a malicious actor um, that is actively trying to compromise anything. It, it is not something that is out there to come and get us. It is not an activity like a botnet or a visor or virus or any of these things. So it's not something that is actively targeting us. Um, so it's not trying to compromise anything. So um, do we then have nothing to fear about the dark web? And the answer then is um, no. We, we have things to fear around the dark web um, because it is where stolen information is up for sale. So um, if you go to an ATM and there's a card skimming device on an ATM, you put your card in, you withdraw money and you walk away and that card skimming device read your card number, that will be sold on the dark web. Um, if you are not careful with your passwords um, and you write them down and they compromise, that will be on the dark web. If you get a phone call from somebody um, uh, spoofing and saying that they are from the bank and they're asking you for your PIN or they're asking you for any personal information, either they're going to use that immediately to try and access and compromise your accounts or they will make it available on the dark web. And the dark web is thus key in the exponential growth of cyber crime, because they also have ready packaged compromise kits. If you would like to do something to somebody in the past, you really need to be technically proficient. I needed to program my own virus or program my own botnet. Um, you can now buy these attacks on the dark net. So you can go to the dark net and say, I would like to attack the website of News24. Um, and you could purchase for a couple of hundred dollars uh, a botnet that you could distribute to pieces all across the world to try to attack the, the domain from News24. You don't need the technical skills and ability to do that. So we find that a lot of people that are not technologically inclined um, is actually able to perform crime. But it's a little bit like making knives. In the early days of, of knife making, the goldsmith or uh, I won't say the gunsmith, the the the, the 
the person that worked with metal, the person that was a metal worker was the person that had a knife. And then we commercialized them. Everybody had knives. So you could walk to a shop, you can buy a copy, flick knife for 50 rand, and you can commit crime with that. And that to an extent is what the dark web has done. It just democratized access to the tools of cybercrime. Now, and this is the, the good news for us. So the normal internet safety mechanisms that protect you from a threat um, on the World Wide Web also protects you from a dark web. So our normal internet safety protocols, not reusing passwords, not compromising passwords, not writing them down, having up-to-date virus software, not clicking on links from emails that we don't know, um, don't take telephone calls, never, ever, 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 ever give your PIN or your details if somebody phones you from the bank and say um, they would like to know your bank account number and all of these things, and immediately you should smell a rat. So many of the things that protect us in general about the internet um, and the surface web are also the things that stop our information from being distributed on the dark web. It is merely the conduit through which all of this information is parked. And it's not something that as an entity we have to fear. We just need to recognize that for cyber criminals, it is easier um, to distribute the information because of the existence of, of the dark web. Right, um, that is my story. Um, that's what I would like to share with you today. It feels like a little bit of a somber one, Johan. Um, the dark web is not uh, the, the lightest of topics that we have. And I'll be delighted if um, there are any questions that I can help anybody with. Martin, thank you very much. Um, just to start off, I've got two questions. The first one is, is there an easy way to know that your own information has been compromised and is somehow available on the dark web? If I don't access the dark web, is there another way how I will know that my information is available there? And secondly, if it is there, what can I do? Can I somehow get someone to remove it or what 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 can i really do yeah johan so um in terms of the first one um, i'm dropping it quickly in the in the chat function i think people may have seen that in the past so if you say ha have i been pawned um so uh, that is uh, an internet service that, that tells us about credentials that's been compromised so if you go to that particular website have I been porn.com? Um, it will tell you. Um, and what that website does, it searches across multiple breaches. So when cybersecurity researchers find breaches of information, um, they would actually put it into the search engine. Um, and you can then see whether your information has, has, has been compromised. So that's the easier part, knowing that it's been compromised. The more difficult part is removing it. Um, and the answer is simply no. Um, it, it is uh, by, by a distance, it is easier um, to change the credentials. It's easier to go to the bank to have a card canceled and to have a new card issued um, and to um, have your information removed. Uh, for example, Johan, I think one of the best practices that people should do, and which I do, is I never use my physical credit cards on the internet but I buy weekly on the internet with a virtual card. So I have a virtual card. I take my mobile phone. My virtual card has limits. I put the limit what I want to buy. I buy it. Um, and only my virtual card number is used on the internet. Um, and whenever I want to buy something for 500 rand or 1,000 or 1,500 rand, I would go into my virtual card. I would increase the limit to that extent and I would make the purchase. So my physical credit card number is, is never used on the internet. And that, that by distance is, is the best way because if your information is on there, it's like that database of, I think it is, can't remember, I think 24 or 27 million South Africans um, with the, the properties deeds office where it was leaked or not necessarily them specifically, but one of the service providers, that information has been online for four to five years. And nobody's been able to take it down. I can maybe also just add to that, um, many of the password managers um, also have a feature where you can enter a list of email addresses and they will actually come back and tell you if any of those email addresses uh, have been compromised on the dark web specifically. I'm using LastPass and that has yes. got a feature like that. 
the next question here from Anne is how do you access a virtual card? Now you're a banking man. Now you must explain that. Um, and and it's, it's actually surprisingly easy. Um, the technology has helped us a lot over the last couple of years. So I think virtually every financial service provider in South Africa has that at the moment. Um, the only challenge is you normally have to have the mobile banking application. So um, I think you may be able to, to set that up on an internet bank account, but on your mobile. So if you have um, the mobile app, so whichever bank you're banking with on the mobile app, um, you could literally create um, an additional virtual card. Um, and it looks like a card, but it's not a physical card. It has a unique number. Um, and uh, you, you can then use that virtual card to do any transaction um, that you would like to do. Uh, I, I mostly use it for internet purchases, but you could also, if, if your phone is um, near field communication, NFC um, compatible, you could also use that for, for, for tap purchases as well. But that's the tap purchases is not the, the biggest thing. So your banks will be able to help you to set it up, but from your mobile application. Martin, thank you very much. Um, once again, like all your previous presentations, it was very easy to follow and clear and well explained. And I could see, I don't know how many times you've done this presentation, but you must have put in a lot of time and effort. So thank you very much. So we've come to the end of this meeting and with it to the end of the NIR as we know it today, my thanks and appreciation to all the presenters during the past two years, uh, nearly 30 individuals who spent a lot of time and effort to inform us about various technology related subjects. A special thanks also to the people who assisted me from time to time, Mike Reynolds who helped me as a Zoom co-host from Times, um, Jeff Burton and Derek van Eden. They both are not here today. They are actually sitting in a plane flying back from overseas as we speak. But Jeff and Derek helped me with putting together items for the I didn't know I can do that series. And then finally to all the members, past and present, uh, some of you were extremely loyal and attended all the meetings. I kept detailed records of who were there and who weren't there. So for those who attended all the meetings, I feel sorry to leave you literally in the dark now. But as mentioned, I'll leave a back door open and may attempt a new version of the NIR, possibly in a different format. Who knows?